Hi everyone, and welcome to the Changing Tides podcast. In each episode, we invite guests to have honest conversations about their mental health journeys with the goal of destigmatizing mental health within the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Due to the nature of the podcast, we'll be discussing a variety of mental health topics and possibly triggering experiences. While we and the majority of our guests are not trained professionals, we encourage you to practice self-care while listening and seek professional guidance if you or a loved one is in need of support. With that said, let's start the episode. Hi, everyone. Uh, Kelly Inoue Perez. I'm currently the head coach for UCLA softball. You know, I've had an amazing journey. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Changing Tides podcast. My name is Matthew Yonamura. And welcome to the episode. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you see that once again, I'm holding the mic. Felt good last time. As you can see, my energy is different today. I'm standing up. Uh, I haven't done the standing intro before. I don't know if I like it. I don't know if you like it. But uh, I'm just, my personal life has been going really well. I'm very happy to share that with y'all because... The consistent listeners of this, they've, you know, you're getting to know me. Uh, and I, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I know you guys. Just kidding. I don't. But anyway, I'm in a very good mood. Life has been going really well for me. I've just been vibing. I've been, you know, just doing my thing. But I'm happy. So I'm, I'm trying this standing thing out. Yeah, but hello. Welcome. I hope everyone's been liking the podcast. Hope your days have been good. Hope, uh... You're excited for this episode. I know that I am excited for this episode for a number of reasons, but one of which is that I have a little CT uh, events to promote. Let me start by promoting that. So we have our first CT cafe that's in person, and it's gonna be Saturday, June 5th at the Terasaki Budokan starting at 10 a.m. So if you're not familiar with the CT cafes, we really just wanna bring people together have some coffee, maybe some tea, uh, just talk about whatever's on your mind. And really, it's just to bring people together if you don't have a space or even if you have a space, but just wanna talk about it with a, a new group with different perspectives. The theme is gonna be transitions. I would love to tell you about what I think of when I hear transitions, but I'll save it for the CT Cafe and hopefully I'll see you there. So you could sign up Go to our Instagram for more information on it, to sign up. We will still be doing CT cafes after this, maybe virtual, maybe in person. We're just gonna, we're just gonna wait and see. We covered my life. We covered the CT cafe. Now we gotta cover this episode's guest. And we happen to get really lucky with the timing and the episode that we're releasing today is timed up perfectly with what's going on in this person's life. Let me, let me give you the resume. This person is a 24 time CWS participant, a three time NCAA champion player, a three time NCAA champion as an assistant coach, the 2010 NCAA champion as the head coach, and the 2019 NCAA champion as the head coach. So if it's not clear yet, this person is a coach. They happen to be the coach of a little school called UCLA. And this person happens to be just named the 2021 Pac-12 Softball Coach of the Year. And it was also just announced that this person is now my personal life coach. So with all that said, this person is currently leading the UCLA Bruins to the 2021 Women's College World Series. Their first game of the World Series is going to be Thursday, June 3rd. So good luck to the team. But most importantly for the purpose of this podcast, good luck to this episode's guests. And also welcome to the podcast, Coach Kelly Inouye Perez. You know, I've had an amazing journey. Uh, I had the great opportunity to compete here at UCLA as a student athlete. Um, was fortunate to be surrounded by some pretty amazing people, coaches and and teammates that allowed us to be successful and win some championships while we were here. Um, and then I was invited to, to stay in this Bruin family and be an assistant coach, actually coach some of my teammates. So 
understood that dynamic of coaching your peers and, and how difficult that was, um, but also very exciting. Um, and then, you know, through my coaching career, I had so many opportunities, wasn't really sure exactly what I wanted to pursue. I knew I was passionate about softball and passionate about UCLA, um, but also I'm um, married and have two children. So it came to a point where I wasn't really sure, you know, what my future was going to hold. Obviously, family comes first and, I, and my children are very important. And I had the opportunity, I was offered the head coaching job. And there's only been two other head coaches prior to me. Um, and I'm very, like I said, committed to the program. So um, I came together with my family and said, you know, if I were to take this job, then it would be a commitment that it would be a teamwork approach. You know, my husband, my kids, my parents, my in-laws, we all got together and we made a decision that was best for the family, which is why I can say now I truly enjoy what I do as the head coach of UCLA softball. My goal is to teach all of my girls to be successful. You've got to keep your priorities straight. Your family always comes first, family and faith. Then school, which is a big part of your experience here, is to be able to get that education and get that degree. And then softball is just what we love to do. So, you know, with that, I have great balance. Um, I can, I'll be straight up. I look forward to talking about, there's been some real challenges, um, you know, emotionally that, and just, just, there's a lot of pressure. Um, there's a lot of expectations. There's a lot of success. And there's also a lot of failure. Um, I'm growing people. So there's a lot of lessons learned. Um, but I sit here today in a great place. The program is healthy. I've got great athletes. I have a wonderful staff. My family's in a great place. And I really love, I really truly believe I have one of the best jobs in the world because I'm surrounded with just wonderful people every day. Thank you so much for being here. I love uh, your response to your mental health journey uh, and how you layered out your priorities for yourself and for your players already. I, I love to hear that. We'll get back to that later on in the interview, but I want us to go ahead and start a little bit more about um, your journey to becoming a head coach and all the steps you got you had to get there. So do you mind sharing a little bit about how you developed your love for softball and your own playing career? Yeah, you know, um, it's, it's really funny because my family that, that obviously has known me since I was really young, they're really shocked that I'm actually in this position because I was very shy super shy, hmm. always next to mom, didn't really, you know, it, I wasn't someone who was really out, outgoing and, and liked to do a lot of things. So I followed my older sister and she, she was just the opposite, just liked to try everything, very social, very outgoing. And so when she did dance and ballet and jazz, I did it. You know, when she did art, I did it. When she did try different sports, I followed. And it was really interesting. And my parents always remembered it was when I tried softball I followed her she did softball so I followed and did softball but there was something about the sport that I looked forward to going to I would jump out of the car and I would run to the field and and it was something that for whatever reason I found success in but I just enjoyed it and I think a big part of it um, I always refer back to this the first coach that I ever had um, you know his name was Gaylord and Gaylord Knapp and he focused on really making it fun and, you know, he said, he even said, you know, for every base that you touch, it's 10 cents on your snack bar card. You don't got to tell me twice, right? I said, wait a minute. So if I hit, if I hit a triple, that's 30 cents. That's literally, I can go get a Jolly Rancher or whatever. I mean, it, it, you know, it was really easy. I was easily motivated. But my point is that I actually got a chance to speak at his funeral, um, which mm. I was so honored to do. But it was him that made me fall in love with the sport that, it allowed me to go and do something that I was, I would never guess I would have because I followed my sister, didn't really want to, found a passion, got surrounded by the right people that had me fall in love with it. It's a very difficult sport, but it was something that I looked forward to learning and I looked forward to doing, trying to do better. And so, you know, I think I say this all the time, you know, a big part of everything that you do, no matter what it is in life, you know, your ability to find something that you're passionate about and surround yourself with people that support that is, is why I'm here today. I've just been surrounded by the right people. My parents have been supportive. I've played on some very you know higher level travel ball teams. I kept on getting picked up to play on different teams. And Lisa Fernandez, who is our all-star, you know, most decorated softball player in, in, in all of softball, we, we paired up and played together when we were 10 and 11 years old. Oh, so wow. I, yeah, which was, which was fun. So she was a pitcher, I was a catcher, we got, we got paired up. So we, we were able to go on this journey of being challenged and finding success, you know, failing and working harder together. So 
Um, and I'm very, I realized I'm really competitive, you know, and, and so failure is never something that ever, you know, would, would ever possibly, you know, distract me or, or discourage me. It actually really motivated me hmm. to want to try to do something about it and being surrounded by people that were the same, you know, I, I was able to do that. Making a decision to be at UCLA was the best decision of my life. The, you know, it was a challenging degree. I've been, I've been fortunate to be in a very successful program, but I'm going to say it again. I truly believe the people that you surround yourself is the key. And it's not just softball here. It's, it's the student body. It's the, it's our, you know, our administration, it's everybody, the alumni that make me so proud because it's people striving for success in everything that they do. And it's hard. It is not easy being a Bruin, but I think that's what I love about it is because it's challenging. And I say this to the girls all the time, if it's hard, if it's hard, then it's worth it because I promise there's an easier path, but that, that adversity is what makes things worth it when you achieve success. So that's, that's a big part of how I, I got here today. Amazing. So a few things I want to touch on. So first off, we had a meeting prior to this just to make sure, you know, we, we were really happy to have you part of the, the program and to introduce you to more things about changing tides. I would never have guessed that you were ever in a shell or shy or anything like that, because as I told you, and as this meeting is already progressing, I'm ready to run through a wall for you. <laughs> I'm no, telling no. you. <laughs> but, but, but that's a big, I mean, you could talk to that because I can talk to how bad I was in the beginning of just being so nervous and mm. being and worrying about what people think and you know I whatever you want to talk about because that is a big part of my journey we, you can ask me questions about that so I can get sidetracked remember I told you <laughs> no, I say a lot of stories so you got to cut me I'll off I'll do my best I'll do my best <laughs> but for, for sure so with your upbringing uh and you said your parents are very supportive I was curious about how being growing up as a Japanese American impacted your love for the sport or your work ethic in general to get you to where you are today? Because I know, I'm sure we both know Japan loves baseball. Yeah. They love that sport. So I was just curious about that. Well, I think there's two things. Um, one of them is I'm a proud Japanese American. Um, I've been fortunate to be raised, um, uh, you know, two parents that have been just very supportive has also given me the opportunity to understand, um, you know, my background and my family and understanding that we are, you know, I'm a third generation Japanese. So just, but it's, they're also local Hawaiians. So we didn't, I didn't speak Japanese. You know, we didn't, we didn't unfortunately know as probably as much as I should about, about, you know, our Japan just in general. Um, but very aware that, that, um, you know, the Japanese culture, the discipline, you know, the, the, the respect, you know, there's things that I love the ways that I was raised by my parents because, you know, they taught me things. Life isn't fair. You know, you've got to work for what you get, you know, res you earn respect. It's not something that you, that you just get um, just manners and, and just expectations, I think in general. So I think being a, a Japanese American, definitely I know who I am and I know who what my foundation is and where my family is from and, and have um, a great deal of respect and pride. Um, I also, on the, the second thing that I was saying is, I also had opportunities, and this is where it's interesting because I've never really looked at myself as a Japanese softball player hmm. because I looked at myself, I was, if anything, if they were to ask what you were, I'd say I'm a catcher, you know, <laughs> like I would say my position because I never really identified as just a Japanese American. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure if, if that really answers the question. So, oh. It, yeah. Definitely. I, I, you know, I actually appreciate that because not everyone that's in the JA community necessarily don't, no one only identifies themselves as a Japanese American. We're multi-layered people, you know, but, it, it, but that pride and what you learn from your background is the beautiful part of what we appreciate about the culture. So I, I'm glad that you, you're so candid about that. Um, so I was, so Japanese American, that's part of what your foundation helped you to, be, to become a UCLA coach. Um, but it wasn't long after you were a UCLA athlete that you became a coach as an assistant. So I was curious about if you ever saw yourself getting into coaching or if you were like the opportunity arose uh, and how you grew into that position. Yeah, I think, you know, I look back in, in, at just the events that led up to where I am today. And there's always some defining moments in your life where you make decisions. You know, do I go to Hawaii? Do I go to UCLA? You know, after I graduated, I was accepted into the master's program for sports psychology. And oh, wow. I, was, 
I had an injured career. I had a, a shoulder surgery and was injured. And so I went from being able to be just very, very fortunate and successful in the sport to, to hitting real adversity with injury. I mean, I mean, I had to take a year off with surgery. So from that, rebuilding back mentally, physically, and then just that appreciation for being healthy and, and being able to, to, to get back to where I was, I really worked with a sports psychologist. So sports psychology was something that I was going to pursue, got into the master's program and was going to pursue it. Um, and then the co my coaches here at UCLA called me three months after I graduated. So I just finished and three months after called and said, you know, we want to keep you here. And wow. I said, as what? And they said, as assistant. So I said, you know, I'm doing my master's and I can have this coaching opportunity. So to answer the question, I wasn't really coaching wasn't something I was pursuing because at the time there wasn't a lot of opportunity for it to be something that could be a career choice. And so it would be more of me continuing to be a part of something that I was familiar with, that I was very close. I was in a leader like role in my senior year. So I could, you know, coach my teammates and, and at the time I had to choose between going to school and, and being able to do this. And it was a difficult decision at that time. So, you know, and then I said, and I had that voice in my head and my parents, you know, helped encourage me that I wanted to continue to do what I was passionate about knowing that I could always go back to school, but this was an opportunity right. once again that I had to make a decision. Um, so yeah, I started, I made the decision to come knowing that I could always go back and, and finish my schooling. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed the fact that where we are today, being a part of growing the sport, being a part of creating the opportunities through, through um, more programs across the country, through TV opportunities, through sponsorships, as far as just people wanting to be affiliated with um, Division I uh, softball, it, it has allowed us to grow at such a great rate that it is now a profession. I yeah. do the ability to be, you know, to be able to have a, a, a a salaried position that can, can support my family. That if you would have asked me that three months after I graduated, it didn't exist. Right. So I was doing it for the love of the game. And I say I'm here because I've been loyal to the program and put the work in, have helped grow the sport. But once again, that was a critical time in my life where I had to make a decision. And I, I still believe I could go back post this career and get into sports psychology because I feel like I'm using that still daily. Um, One million percent. So yeah, for this, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you say would be happy to take you back. You, I mean, you <laughs> clear, they, like as a student, because you've clearly been great as a student athlete, now a coach. Um, so I'm sure they'd be happy to take you back. Yeah, um, and I'm passionate about it, so definitely. <laughs> that's awesome. And you're, we'll talk about how good of the decision it was to get into coaching in just a second, because your record and the accolades clearly pointing the direction it was the right choice. Uh, but before we get into your head coaching career, I was curious about what being an assistant coach taught you and prepared you for the head coaching gig of this, yeah. this elite team. Yeah, you know, I really enjoyed my assistant coaching years. Um, first, being able to coach my teammates, I was such a young assistant, but then really understanding the role. And I truly believe um, in order to be a good head coach, you have to understand and appreciate what, what an assistant coach does. And I took a great deal of pride in taking care of the girls. It's easier being an assistant than it is being a head coach because you have different relationships with the athletes. But the most important part, which I think is just a big part of being successful in life is understanding you're a part of a, an organization. And my job is to be able to make sure everyone's clear about what the head coach, um, what the head coach's philosophy was, what, what, what was important priority wise. So I was more of a liaison, a communicator between the athletes the parents, you know, anybody with what the head coach really wanted to get accomplished and have the mess out be about the program. And I took pride in that, you know, so I may have not always agreed, but I knew what my role was. My role was to be an interpreter and, and have those conversations with the players or parents or recruits or anybody, because I took pride and had a great deal of respect for the head coaches prior to me in building the program. Um, so it was a blast being assistant. It was also a lot of drama. I'm with the girls all the time. I'm, I understand, you know, being a collegiate athlete or just being an athlete or just in general, everybody has stuff off the field. Right. And, and that's just life. And until you really, you know, you know, the old saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. As an assistant coach, I think that's a very valuable part of your, what is most important is your job is to get those, get your athletes to know you care about them as people. 
And, and as an assistant, you go into the extra layer of what's happening once you leave the field. How's the classroom? How's your personal life? How's family? How are all these decisions that you're making in society? So I, I really enjoyed that because I'm a people person. I love dealing with the girls and, and building them up or also making sure that they understood how to keep their priorities straight. Right. Um, but I had that ability to be really close. So as a head coach, it, honestly, it was a difficult decision or it was a difficult transition because I was really close to the girls. And then I, I became, I, I, they just looked at me different as a head coach. Yeah. Um, so that was, that took some time because the relationships, I, you know, you're no longer Kelly. I now you're coach. I, you know, we, we, I transitioned, but where I am today, um, being an assistant, I, you know, I value that so much because I now I know so much more as a student athlete, as an assistant coach, being a head coach, I have an awareness of what's really going on. I've mm-hmm. walked in their shoes. I've had those conversations. I've learned a lot. I could write a book, but, you know, but your ability to understand that as a head coach, I think is so important that you're dealing with people and how you manage my staff, my players and everybody around us, which we call the Bruin bubble, alumni, families, and everybody is how you create a healthy culture so that we can just get out here and play softball. Um, so all of it, has contributed to, and I'm still learning. I don't know it all, but I think that's the best part is when you're dealing with people, you'll never know it all. You just have to manage situations, but keep your priorities straight in the bigger picture. My job is to develop, you know, strong female leaders that are going to be successful, you know, through mentoring and modeling and, you know, and teaching. That's my job is I'm here to create, not create, I'm here to empower the greatness in these athletes. And I think that's something that I'm really passionate about. And I have great perspective now from the experiences that I had as a player, as an assistant, to where I am today. We're taking a quick break to introduce Anchor, the sponsor of this podcast. Anchor is free, first and foremost, which is amazing. Who doesn't love free? And you can record everything directly into Anchor. It's so easy to use Anchor. That's how you are listening to this podcast, whether it's Spotify, Apple, the the Anchor website. You're listening to it because I uploaded this podcast episode to Anchor. If you want to start your own podcast, I highly recommend Anchor. It's made this whole process so easy. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. So we just came back. Uh, all this talk about your your um, your time playing, about being an assistant coach, this has all led to you now becoming the head coach, which all this clearly has helped you become this head coach of this elite team. You're... It's evident in your 0.783 winning average over 15 seasons, which, I mean, as a first-time coach, it's not easy to jump right in and be a winning team. And uh, if people look at the stats, you continue to get better as a team and as a coach. So just in case anyone wants to check out the the stats behind it. Um, But I was curious how you teach your players to persevere through these seasons, like continued success. How do you teach that rather than just being an athlete, how do you teach perseverance in the grand scheme of things? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, you know, I credit my athletes and all of them constantly on having the courage to be able to be on this platform, you know, that you're challenging yourself and you're going to succeed and you're going to fail. So I always remind them, remember you, remember what you signed up for, that you signed up for this challenge. And and we, and we do things like I use analogies, um, like, you know, I call them all diamonds in the rough. You know, we, we've we already, re- we've recruited you, you stood out, we're here to be a part of something great. But if everyone understands how a true diamond is made, you know, from a, a piece of black coal through extreme heat and pressure, you become a better version and that priceless diamond. So I have visuals and I, and we talk to that, they all know what DIR means, it's diamond in the rough because in those extreme heat and pressure moments is what is gonna allow you to become that priceless most, you know, the strongest stone out there. So I always preface that because when I'm recruiting them, when I'm, you know, when we start a season, I always say it's going to be hard, but it, and, and I want them to understand that this is, you know, we all want to be a part of UCLA softball in this tradition and the history speaks for itself, but we also have to understand where we are now. And it, in that process, heat, pressure, success, failure, that's the secret sauce that allows you to become something greater than you were when you stepped into the program. So, you know, but but to answer the question real specifically, um, you know, I've been fortunate to be mentored by some pretty amazing people. And Coach Wooden, John Wooden, 
who is, you know, obviously the most successful basketball coach. I asked him a question about carrying on the tradition of, you know, such a, a powerhouse of UCLA softball. You know, we are the winningest program in Division One softball. Basketball for John Wooden was the win most winning, and um, and he and he gave me one of his John Wooden, you know, mantras or cliches that Kelly, you have no control over the past, and that all that success is the past. You have no control over the future, but you really have to create a masterpiece today. Mm. And I can tell you, when he first told me that. I was like, great, how is that going to help me right now, right? Like, uh -huh. I think in that, but it was until I could truly understand and, and really, really narrow it down and simplify it to understanding how to control what's in your control is the bottom line. And so I talked to the girls constantly about, first of all, we know why we're here. It's, we're here to, to be challenged because we, we're striving to accomplish something pretty great and it's worth it. The process is the key. So your ability to understand the process, to trust this process, what is that process? You're going to get challenged. I'm going to push you. If you're not failing, you're not, you're not, you're not really pushing to be able to see just how great you are, but to manage failure is probably one of my biggest things. Understanding you have a choice when you fail or adversity hits, you have a choice. You could either go this way or you could go that way. And I, I encourage them to recognize that. So when things get hard, they don't get overwhelmed and make the easy choice to quit they actually encourage it like, okay, this means I'm going to be a better version after this. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable, but it will allow me to be a better person if I can figure out a way to get through that. And guess what? You're not on your own. You have a support, a, a support structure of, of coaches and teammates and, and staff. They're going to help you get through this. And so I encourage them. I get them to understand what it is, what is hard, what is adversity, what is failure. And in the bigger picture of all these, if you're worried about the past, like I did, I wasn't doing well, or I don't feel good. Or if you're worried about the future, if I don't do it, people are going to say this, or I'm not going to start. I'm not going to play, you know, the social media is terrible, but if I really focus on just being the, just going for it in this moment, and we simplify it like that, how to eliminate noise, how to perform in a moment is really understanding how to be present. And what do you have in your control? Coach Wooden's pyramid, your effort and your attitude. He calls it industriousness is your work and your enthusiasm is your attitude. And that that leads you to competitive greatness at the top. So we simplify it. There's a lot of words, but work hard, love what you do, and you, you're going to be able to accomplish some pretty great things. I love that. And you know, there's with that, you're you're not encouraging them to fail. You're not encouraging them to mess up necessarily, but you're encouraging them to to strive for Absolutely. more than what's easy. Absolutely. And and with that, there's a level of a vulnerability that you're encouraging your team to have because as you said you're a member of their support system but with that vulnerability that's a stigma that's a come with athletes um, luckily there has been a change over the last couple of years or so but your need your players clearly need to trust you and they need to trust one another especially with the the type of coaching that you're doing yeah. so with that i was curious how you help foster this sense of commu community and how you help them find the courage to open up when they are struggling. Yeah, I think first and, first and foremost, as I said before, you know, players don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And you know, we are family. You know, we, we put ourselves in a position, I say it all the time, you're more than just softball players. Right. You know, softball doesn't define you. It's something that you're passionate about doing. So those are things that I remind them constantly of, of being able to understand who they are. Whether you get a hit or not doesn't define you, it, but you but you should be excited about the opportunity that you just had. So I, I always flip it from the, the thought process of what failure could do versus the opportunity that you get to succeed and how you're this, you know, in sports here for us, it's one pitch away. I mean, mm. literally you could be over or swing and miss at two pitches and one pitch you hit it out. I mean, it's, it's a really unique dynamic of if you could get caught up in failure, then you're going to miss the opportunity to be successful. So we talk about it often, but I think the process, what I, they know that what's important to me is how they present themselves. So I can say, you know, if I was on a live deal, I would literally say to everybody, I just want you to see what it feels like to, to sit up your shoulders back and your chin up and say, I'm great. So I'll have somebody look at, at another person and that's awkward, right? Like you want me to do what, you know? So if I were to tell everyone on the podcast to sit up and literally shoulders back and chin up, just how you feel instantly 
is empowering. Like, mm-hmm. wow, this is weird. I kind of feel like I'm looking at the world from a different view mm-hmm. and being able to authentically look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm great. Look at yourself. So I have them look at each other and say, I'm great. And if they can't, if the teammates can't believe it, then that's something that we got to work on. Mm-hmm. But if you can't convince yourself that if you can't convince yourself that you are great, like, and, and I'm not talking about whether you just got a hit or not, I truly believe shoulders back, chin up, and I feel pretty good you know, about myself. I mean, I have no idea what we're doing next, but I feel pretty good versus, you know, and especially in our world now on Zooms and all of this, you know, we, we just, you, you, by nature can, you, kids are learning from their beds, you yeah. know, it's a difficult time. So body language, I talk about this, your facial expression and your tone on how you communicate with people are things that I teach them to understand how to build that confidence. And then with it, I talk to things that they can do meaning I want to see body language. I want to see you smiling and having fun with this. And I want to hear a tone when you communicate that it's for what's best for the team. And those are tangibles versus someone telling you, you know, you're not doing well, or you have a bad attitude, like you can't really measure it. And if you tell somebody they don't, they have a bad attitude, what's one of the first things they say back? No, I don't. Uh Right. And if you, that's a judgment. So you know, going back to it, I think the most important part is, you know, to build trust, there's a culture that we really focus on, you know, being able to be, to be vulnerable is something that we embrace. That means you're pushing the limit and you have the courage or the guts to go for it. I give you credit for even having the opportunity to go for it. Whether you succeed or fail doesn't define you, but man, I lift you up that you went for it. And that's the environment that we have as we're pushing the limit. We're creating a culture of, of a really a, a positive to be able to go for it. Failure, once again, creates an opportunity. I say the game plays games with you all the time. When people fail, watch what happens. This sports gives you a chance to come back around and either you're sad about it or pouting or you're actually waiting for that opportunity and the game gives you those extra opportunities. So I think there's a lot of life lessons that go along with sports. I think culture is created by understanding why we're here and what the process is. And then we encourage, once again, we encourage adversity because adversity is what makes us a better version of ourselves at the end. And you reminded me to fix my posture up, and I, like it did, <laughs> it did make me, feel, it did make me feel a lot better. I felt like I wasn't just like slouching at my computer screen, you know. So oh, thank you for that. But yeah. but you know, all the all this advice, all the way that you go approach coaching, it's helped UCLA softball not be any run of the mill team. Like it's clearly an amazing program considering your record your championships as both a player and a coach. It's it's not just a moment in time thing. It's been a very mm-hmm. successful program. Um, so clearly with that, there is a pressure that's associated with for you and your team that you've, you're gonna face year to year. So with that, how do you make sure you and your team is mentally healthy enough to persevere through that season and yeah. get through it? So, you know, when we, when we talk about expectations, expectations, can be seen as, once again, a negative or a positive. Most people would say expectations are negative because that's pressure. And, but, you know, I think a big part of what I've learned um, being in this program, but also I've had some wonderful mentors and sports psychologists that how you, your, you know, your perception is your reality, how you perceive things, your, your perspective. So we say things like pressure is a privilege. Mm. Pressure is a privilege. Wow. Because that means that you're doing something that you know you have to have the courage to go do, and if you are successful, then you've accomplished something great. So it's a privilege to feel that because you're doing something that has great meaning. Versus pressure. Oh my gosh, if you don't succeed, what is going to happen? Or what are they going to say? Or how are you going to let down? Like we don't even think like that. Pressure is a is a privilege. Do my girls feel pressure? One hundred percent. I played this sport too. But if you look at it and flip your mindset to being excited, that energy that you feel or that nervousness or your heartbeat or the sweaty palms and all those things that come with, for whatever reason I'm feeling this, is once again, your body telling you you're, it's actually fueling you to go versus reminding you that, oh no, this is really scary. And I say this to my team, gosh, probably every week, I'll literally say, you know, the only expectation, only expectations that matter are whose, and they'll say our own. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely, and a lot of things outside of this, but what matters most is what we expect of ourselves. And what do we expect to do? We expect to win, but expectations alone don't allow that. There is, so if you expect that, then we have to set up a plan of how you're going to get there. And that's where the process comes in with work 
ethic and your attitude and your commitment and the sacrifice that you make so that you can be prepared for that big moment. And we have phrases like one shot, you know, we get prepared. I don't, and I say this to my team, I don't know who is going to get the opportunity in that big moment to win us a national championship, but I hope all of you are preparing for that moment. So in that, that one shot moment, don't know who it's going to be, right. but I'm rely, everybody's relying on everyone to prepare for that. So there's all of these things lead up to people could call that internal pressure expectations. Yeah, we do that. We set, we put ourselves in a position, we set standards, right. we have goals. We want, you know, the girls make up the goals and we're, we're all heading in the same direction. But to kind of get to your point, I think the bottom line is we create a culture where we embrace adversity. We know that there's expectations and there's gonna be pressure because we're doing something that is not what the normal people sign up for. Right. And I, I, I embrace, we embrace it and I lift them up to say, I give you credit for even stepping on that stage. Because there's so many people that are looking at you. I love, I, I'm just letting you know now, you've inspired the, my next tattoo, my Instagram <laughs> caption, my, the book, the title of my book, you my album. Killing me. You're killing me. <laughs> uh, pressure is a privilege was like you know because that that it spreads throughout so many different aspects of life mm -hmm. it's whatever you feel that it's a new it's probably because it's a new opportunity or yes. it's a new, yes. new a new situation you're being put in and because yes. of that that means the door was opened or you're in this you're in the place where that could be possible so i love that so much and just i'm, I'm gonna be writing down all these quotes and they're yes. gonna be everywhere um but you you know your your players are much more than just softball players. You're much more than a Japanese American, as you said. There's so many multiple there's so many multiple layers to people. So I was just curious about for you, when, you know, when you're not busy coaching, you're also a mother of two. Um, how do you balance work, family life, um, while making sure you're able to take care of yourself? Yeah. Because you sure. you know it's going to be hard for you to mentor and coach if you're not good in your own headspace. Yeah, for sure. I think. You know, I get asked the question a lot of how you have what, you know, work-life balance. And um, I think there are times in my life where I definitely felt like I wasn't doing enough here or I wasn't doing enough there. And that feeling or just traffic, like oh, I'm always late or I'm getting, you know, there's this constant worry of what you're not. And, and I think through this process of being a, 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 an athlete and being an assistant and being a mother and a, or a wife and then a mother and and this head coach, I've learned to appreciate what I have versus worrying about, you know, what I don't. Right. And qual you know, quality time is so much more important than quantity. There's a guilt with being a parent of not being able to spend every single second with your kids. But the, the, the rewarding part for me was I had family support with my in-laws and my parents that wanted to be involved in their grandchildren's lives. So I was fortunate to be able to have the opportunity where every, they were they were still surrounded by family, and I had to let that go of of understanding I couldn't be in two places at once. So, the work life balance comes comes from being able to just like with everything in life, being able to prioritize and manage you know time manage when when do I need to be where I need to be, and then when I'm there, be there, <laughs> not being worried about what else I should do. So I have straight up, I have been the mom that came home and just was straight in mom mode until midnight and then would start work afterwards, you know? And then I realized that's not good because then I myself get worn down. So I have to manage my time on when I get after going for a hike or getting exercise in for myself, when I spend time with my husband, when I spend time with my kids, when I focus on work and I am a busy person. So I actually embrace it and I love it. I love being busy. I love doing a lot of things. So it energizes me. I don't like being overwhelmed. I don't like it when I, when I miss out on things and I would be lying to say any different, but I also have really quality, intentional relationships with people. I feel, I feel very fortunate. I have a really healthy family. When I say I have great relationships with my husband and my, and my two children, because they, I've asked them, I'm like, you know, would you want mommy to quit and be spend more time? And it sounds like a selfish or it's not a very great question to ask kids, but I love that they also take pride that I'm a part of something that they're proud of, you know, that I want to be for my girls. I want to be an example to everyone out there that you can be a mother and have a job and be married and do all of this. Is it hard? Oh, heck yeah, it's hard. <laughs> but, you, but you can do it because I, I, you know, we can fall into that idea that you just have to be um, a stay home mom and, that, but, and let dad go to work. 
And even in the Japanese culture, there could be yeah. expectations that, of what you should be. I love it. You know, because that's the thing. It's all about priorities. There's going to be a checklist of things you need to get done. And eventually they're going to get done. But you have to remember. Exactly. Yeah. So I love to hear it. Um, I do want to ask you some quick fire questions yeah. that just to help to get to know you a little bit. But I was curious if there's anything you wanted to say before we jump into that. Uh, no, I say go for it. Go for it. Cool. Perfect. So some of these are going to be fun. I'm hoping to that your players get to get to know you a little bit or some some fun stuff. But um, I want to start off by asking what your proudest achievement is as a player. Ooh, you know, my proudest achievement as a player was coming back post my surgery. Mm. So uh, three shoulder surgeries, um, rehab for a year in the training room, came back and had a great season and was um, it was so hard. <laughs> emotionally and physically and then being able to come back was able to get back to the world series and had a great world series we made the all made the all you know world series team won a national championship so it was a perfect example of when i thought i would never play again at the low low and a lot of pain and my yeah. ego was checked like whoa i i'm not playing building myself back up and you know because i say this all the time when it's easy it's easy but when you get challenged and it's, and I say this to the girls, um, I say a lot clearly, but <laughs> one of the things that I always say, and they, they would know this is, is um, it's not what happens, but it's what you do next. That is your defining moment. And I think that was my defining moment and why I'm here today is I so could have quit. My best friend, Lisa was rolling. I was, couldn't even throw and my ego was checked, but I kept on working and to be rewarded. That was my biggest moment. Uh, what is your proudest achievement as a coach? Um, my proudest achievement, it's, it's funny. There's just been, there's been so many moments, so many stories, but it's the stories of knowing that these girls have had challenges and just seeing them go through the, that adversity and being at such a low emotionally and physically, and then seeing them shine once again, a shoulders back chin up moment on the stage. I I've been fortunate to see so many great stories like that, that as a coach, I'm my job is to help build them back up when things get hard. When it's when we're killing the ball and we're scoring a lot of runs and we're winning, that's easy. But it's the hard stuff, it's the challenges that I really love about coaching. That's what that's what keeps me going. So I'll give you a specific example. Kira Garrell was a pitcher in 2003 who was just not in a good place prior to the World Series. Game one, just not in a good place, lost it. We lost the game, we got in the loser's bracket. And through that tournament, just being able to work with her and talk her up and through tears and fear of what if I don't. And I remember I gave her a little, um, there was a moment I gave her a little something. I, I called her and said, before the championship, we worked our way back to the loser's bracket and we were back in the championship and, um, and we were facing the same team that we played that beat us in game one. So, I mean, hello drama, right? I know. <laughs> so such a story. So I met with her and said, I have something for you. And, you know, she was a mess. Um, just nervous. So I gave her this little compact and this little mirror. And I said, oh, I said the key to today's, I want you to open this. And it, it is the key to, to, to what's gonna allow us to be successful today. And she looked at me and she's like, what is in this? I said, open it. So it was a little compact and she was all about makeup, right? But uh -huh. on the mirror, it just said, you're perfect, you're beautiful and everyone mm -hmm. loves you. And of course she started bawling. Okay, <laughs> the cool part was yeah, she was lifted up in the moment and, she, and it felt good. And it was a funny ha-ha because it was a compact and she's a makeup girl. She went out on that stage completely just this, I mean, shoulders back, chin up, but she went for it. And she, not only did we win another, another national championship, she went on to throw a, a no-hitter, a nine-inning no-hitter, the only no-hitter in the history of the, of the NCAA tournament in the championship game. Like I sit here today and go, did that just happen? She went from <laughs> crying and, and like days before to the championship. And she literally is in the history books with the only no hitter in the championship game, not just regulation seven, nine innings. Isn't that cool? That's Those are cool moments that I say, and I was just falling. I, I could that. say great practices and work ethic and a hundred percent, but it's the real stories of these young females really being vulnerable, putting in the work, trusting it and getting a payback. Um, and it doesn't always happen but it's mm. very rewarding when it does. I love it. And also you said you could write a book, but I think you have a movie, I think you have a movie deal with, with that story, with, the, with that playoff story. That was a good story. That was a good story. Amazing. Um, if you could describe your coaching style in three words, 
what would those three words be? Um, my coaching style. Um, my coaching style. Let's see. Why is this a question that is? Making- oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. What is this? You know, I truly, truly just enjoy the process. Mm. There's my three words. I enjoy okay. the process. Okay. Um, I Perfect. think that, um, and that's that to me is probably the best part of this job. I love it. I love it. So as we mentioned in our meeting before this interview, I am like one of the few changing ties people who's not UCLA, which <laughs> I know it's- We got you, we got you, we got love, it's all good. <laughs> but uh, because of all the UCLA people that are so, a part of changing ties, I was curious from your time as at UCLA as a student to now <laughs> as a coach, I'm curious what has changed most about the school, whether it be oh. appearance or like the culture of it. Uh, well, everything. I think um, literally the, the campus is constantly growing. Um, there's buildings being put up. Things are getting um, updated. There were, you know, three dorms and now there's literally buildings all over the place. Um, just the student, the Ackerman Union was, you know, a bookstore. And now it's this pretty amazing, almost indoor mall <laughs> that, has, that has so many great things. Um, I think facilities have changed, but I think um, the heart and the soul of UCLA um, I believe is very still, very, very much still the same. And when I, I say that, a big part of it, we talk about the buzz and the vibe of what UCLA is all about. And UCLA is, is unique. We have an academic tradition. We have an athletic tradition in a, in a location that a lot of people, it's not a bad place to be in LA. So you're surrounding yourself with people from all over the world. We're also a very diverse you know, and we've gotten better at being more and more diverse through the years as far as having the opportunities because we have more applications to any other school in the country to UCLA. But once again, when you get back to the, the heart and soul of it, um, I love being surrounded by people that want to be great. But if the only thing that really has changed is some of the buildings. Like if you look on it, if you come on campus back in the 70s and 80s, a lot less buildings. And now all of a sudden, you know, there's parking structures underneath you know, underneath the IM field, like that was, uh-huh. there, you know, there, and things have been renovated to be more modern, which is just mm. exciting. But, I mean, I wish I had the grades at the time to get into you <laughs> or, or the softball talent, if you were going to take me on the team, I know that wasn't going to happen, but um, uh, what is your go-to karaoke song? Oh God, I am so not a karaoke person <laughs> at all, but I would have to say, I can't even, I can't even, that's a bad question for me. Is there, is there like a driving song that if it comes on, you'll, you'll just scream it? Well, um, gosh, that's a, through the years. I think there's so many songs that have meanings. Um, you know, this is going to sound like so crazy to you, but Lose Yourself by Eminem, which is <laughs> rap, <laughs> was such a meaningful song. And, uh-huh. And not ask me to sing because I want to fuck you, Matthew. No. You know what? Maybe maybe I'll leave your players to ask you to rap it word for word. <laughs> yeah. No. No. They know that. For They're sure. like, oh, I would not be a karaoke. Karaoke. For sure. Okay. I'll, uh, I won't take up too much more of your time. I'll get to the net last few of them. Uh, if you can invite five people to dinner, dead or alive, who would they be? Oh, you know, we played this game. I Tommy Lasorda would be one. Oh. Yeah. He's just he he was someone that I always <laughs> we always uh valued. Um, we talk, I, I said Oprah would be on my island. Never met her, but I think she is somebody that would be would be pretty valuable. Okay. I'm gonna tell you that I think uh, The Rock would be somebody who would be Ooh. someone that, and it's it's funny. Um, you know, the girls would always laugh about, oh, okay, Coach, really, The Rock. Um, he just seems like he has a wonderful personality and great energy um, about that. Uh, Derek Jeter was somebody that was on my list, so. Tommy Lasorda, Derek Jeter, Oprah, The Rock, and then Bruno Mars was my fifth. Wow, that's a great list. Right? So I, I love that I, list. I don't know. That's a little bit about all of, of you know, of, of kind of who I would love to be surrounded by. Love that. That, that was a great, I, I love that answer. That's one of my favorite ones so far. <laughs> uh, and then just to round it out, if you could give yourself, inv- give advice to yourself from, let's say, Prior to you being a coach, let's say right out of college, what would that advice have been? Ooh, prior to me going to college? Prior, prior, or just after college, sorry. Um, my, 
if so my advice on what would be different any I, advice you I, any advice you'd like to give to yourself well i just think i feel like i followed the advice of i wanted to do what i was passionate about you know and i didn't get paid a lot of money being a coach but i was something that i loved to do and that's that to me is probably you know the biggest thing i i've been faced with tough decisions and and have made them but i've followed my heart cuz i think I love what I do and I followed my heart. And during those times where I wasn't making a lot of money, I definitely could have redirected and went and done something different. But, you know, I, I, I stayed the course of what I was passionate about and found ways to be able to make ends meet. And I have no regrets, shoulders back, chin up and go for it. And then you, you have no regrets. I love it. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That rounds out the interview. Uh, it was so great talking to you. As I, I'll tell you for like the fifth time, I'm ready to run through a wall for you. Just tell me. Just well, tell me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And I'm very proud to be a part. Thank you again to Coach Kelly for joining us on the podcast, talking about motherhood, talking about being an athlete, becoming a coach, uh, vulnerability in sports. Uh, it was just honestly, it was an honor for me to talk to Coach Kelly. And once again, as I said in the intro, good luck to them in the World Series. Uh, we really actually got lucky with the timing of when all this was released. And it's really happenstance. We knew that they'd be in the World Series, but we didn't know this episode was going to release right now. So it just timed out perfectly. But if you enjoyed this episode, you could subscribe to our show for our episodes releasing on every other Tuesday and give us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you would like to support our podcast and help us grow, you can do so with the donation link at the bottom of the episode description. To hear more about Changing Tides, follow us on Instagram at LTSC underscore Changing Tides or check out our website, thechangingtides.org. Let's continue to change the tides on mental health. Yeah.